Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the final session of the India Inclusion Summit. Uh, I am delighted to have uh, two absolute legends in the technology field, both of whom I am very pleased to say as, uh, as not just collaborators in, uh, in my journey, but also dear friends. And maybe the only silver lining of COVID has been that I'm able to get both Windsurf and Rishad Premji at the India Inclusion Summit virtually. I can tell you I've been chasing them for many years to be part of the summit, but maybe uh, in a virtual mode, uh, we've had the time to do this uh, for the first time. Um, and before we get into uh, a more detailed conversation, a very brief introduction, both of them don't need one, but I would still try to make it uh, very brief for the audience. Uh, Windsurf is one of the fathers of the internet along with Bob Khan. Uh, he's seen almost 50 years of internet and I'm very keen to know what his take has been and what does he see as the next 50 years. Um, so Wint, thank you so much for being part of the India Inclusion Summit. I'm happy to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. And Rishad is a very dear friend. Um, I first met him when he was selected as a young global leader and I very proudly claim that I'm one of his mentors at YGL. Uh, but more than that, he's of course a very dear friend and uh, the chairman of uh, Wipro, a role that he took over in July 2019. So Rishad, thank you so much for taking the time to be part of the summit. I'm very keen to know how this a little over one and a half years has been for you. I'm sure this has been uh, you know, uh, an interesting but also a challenging time, right? So first of all, Firoz, thank you for having me. And it's a uh, pleasure to be here and to be with you, Vint, as well. Um, it's, been a, it's been an interesting uh, roller coaster ride, uh, to, say the, to say the least, over the last uh, 15 months. You know, um, I took over and we've just been through, obviously, COVID, which has been something that everybody has experienced differently. And then we've also been through a, a, a CEO reorganization. Uh, our CEO left us in January and we had a new CEO join us. Uh, Thierry Delaporte in July, and so I was playing a much more active and hands-on role for, uh, for for several months. So I, I joke with people and I say, you know, if I can get some of the tough stuff out in the first year of this new job, then hopefully things can look better from here. But look, it's it's uh, so it's been an ex exciting, interesting, challenging uh, 15 months. But I also feel very blessed, very blessed to have this opportunity uh, to take over on this platform. Very proud of the organization that has been built and uh, proud not only for what we've accomplished in terms of performance, but really having built an organization on a bedrock of uh, very, very high integrity and strong governance, which just becomes a great launch pad from which to do exciting things as we move into this new phase and new age of technology. So it's, 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 it's predominant of being really, really humbled and blessed and really excited as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Rishad. So maybe I'll start um, briefly with wind. Um, you know, you've seen 50 years of the internet uh, and I'm sure you wouldn't have thought about looking forward when you, when you started uh, 50 years ago, the impact of the internet. And I know it's very hard to, you know, divide the black and whites of it, but overall, when you see, are you happy with what the internet has achieved? Uh, being very aware that there have been some downsides as well. Uh, and what is your vision for the next 50 years of the internet? Well, first of all, I'm not sure that I could project 50 years ahead, although I appreciate uh, the framing of the question because I'll be dead by the time 50 <laughs> years elapse. So if I'm wrong, I won't be embarrassed because I won't be around to <laughs> suffer the consequences. Uh, I will say though, that even though we could not have predicted in detail everything that uh, has happened in the course of internet's uh, evolution, uh, I, will, I will argue that um, there, it's unquestionably true that computing power uh, is incredibly enabling. And it, we've seen that power get uh, more and more, you know, grow more and more over time. Moore's law has, has been supplanted now by multiple cores instead of increased clock speed, but capacity has gone up in every dimension. Uh, and of course, because computing has become less and less expensive, uh, you know, per unit of uh, computing power. We put computers everywhere now. And so we hear the Internet of Things is a common expression. And over time, I think computing and networking uh, will penetrate into every bit of our 
daily lives if it has not already. Now, for half the world's population, direct access and use of the internet is still out of reach, something that I care a great deal about. I'm sure that over the next 50 years, this kind of capability will be available to everyone readily at reasonable cost, sustainably and safely, which does raise some interesting questions about safety, which we might come to in a later part of our conversation. Uh, so uh, the 50% that doesn't have access will have access. Everyone's access will increase in speed, almost certainly, uh, and in, uh, in availability. Uh, when we see things like uh, Starlink coming from SpaceX uh, with the 24,000 satellite plan, uh, it will be almost impossible to escape access to the internet uh, after that system is up and running. So I anticipate uh, increased use of the uh, computer and communication technology space uh, for virtually everything, seeing um, as that the, uh, I would say that there are no limits to software. This is sort of a, an unexplored but uh, infinite frontier. You can essentially do anything that you can figure out how to program. And so I see that as a sort of an unlimited opportunity for creativity and invention. And indeed, that's what we're seeing. So 50 years from now, we will still have people inventing new applications uh, and new uses for computers and communication. I just don't know what they are yet. Probably 50 years from now, we may actually be uh, well on our way to exploring the solar system a lot more deeply than we have been able to so far, including uh, people going uh, to, uh, to the planets as opposed to just robotic instruments. Um, but I want to jump quickly to the topic of uh, disability and when you have a personal association with the topic. Um, and again, I, I'm very keen to know, you know, there are a lot of statistics which shows that COVID has disproportionately affected uh, people with disabilities and of course the marginalized community overall. Uh, but I wanted to hear what's your personal association with disability and how do you see technology playing a, a very important role in kind of making it a much more level playing ground uh, for the, the, the marginalized communities? So uh, first of all, um, I was uh, born six weeks premature in 1943. And so we guess that uh, they put me in an oxygen tent because my lungs are not fully uh, developed. And it's, it's assumed that uh, the uh, impact of being in a, an oxygen environment, high oxygen environment, initiated a, a sensory neural nerve loss in my hearing which over time has uh, lost about one dB per year. Uh, I started wearing hearing aids when I was 13 and the hearing aids have gotten better at about the same rate my hearing has gotten worse. So I've managed to stay more <laughs> flat. Um, it's, but it, it certainly um, helped make me a lot more empathetic for people who have um, long-term disabilities or even short-term ones. You know, and if you break your leg and you're in a wheelchair for six weeks, you begin to appreciate what it's like if you could had to be in that wheelchair for you know the rest of your life as opposed to a finite amount of time everyone has experienced some disability if, if uh, only short term it's like flying in an airplane and landing and your ears are all stuffed up and you begin to see what it's like to be deaf or hard of hearing so i've been very lucky that technology has allowed me to participate in the hearing world in a more or less normal way uh, my wife has a much more dramatic story to tell. She was uh, born with normal hearing, but when she was three years old, she caught uh, spinal meningitis, which uh, it produced a really, really high temperature, like 105 or 106 degrees Fahrenheit. And it destroyed the ciliar hairs inside of her cochlea, which are the means by which sound is transduced into neural pulses and the brain recognizes that as sound. So for 50 years, she was profoundly deaf. She had to lip read. She didn't learn how to sign. She raised a family, went to, went to college, you know, got her degrees, went to work uh, in an, an entirely silent world. And then uh, at age 53 in 1996, uh, she discovered cochlear implants by going out on the net, which was very satisfying for me and doing some <laughs> and discovered that, uh, that Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore uh, had specialists uh, who could do cochlear implants. So she went up to be tested and they said, yes, your, your uh, auditory nerve is still okay. It's just that the little ciliar hairs aren't there. 
we could do an implant, which they did. And it was absolutely dramatic. Uh, it, she, it's a 45 minute outpatient operation. Uh, she, uh, she came back to the hospital after a couple of weeks after the surgery and they turned on the speech processor, which is a little thing about the size of a mobile. And within 20 minutes of programming it, she picked up the phone and called me. Now you have to understand, <laughs> we've been married for 30 years and had not been able to use the phone. And so this was a very dramatic moment. The conversation wasn't all that deep, but it was a <laughs> very powerful, very powerful thing. By the time I got home, I discovered that I couldn't get her off the phone. She was a 53-year-old teenager. Any calls that came in were fine, including, you know, uh, people calling to sell, you know, uh, you know, products and services. Now, at the time, I was the senior VP of engineering at uh, MCI. And, uh, and so uh, AT&T called her to see if she would like to switch her phone service to AT&T. And so she picked up the phone and said, oh, hello, where are you? And the person said, I'm in Bangalore. And she said, oh, well, that's fascinating. Tell me a little bit more about, so half an hour goes by and this poor person says, well, now you're gonna switch, aren't you? And she says, no, my husband works for MCI, but thanks for calling. And she hangs up the phone, <laughs> that it gets better. Then she decided that because she had been deaf all those years, that there were words that she hadn't heard that uh, she should hear to know how they were pronounced. So she decided to get recorded books for the blind. So she calls the library on the phone and she says, hi, can I sign up for recorded books? And they said, sure, no problem, you know, name, address, phone number. They said, now you're blind, aren't you? And she says, no, I'm deaf. And there's this long pause while they're trying to figure out how to work. She listened to 500 books on tape and, and now she's good at recognizing accents and, and recognizing when people mispronounce words. She also uh, went after an FM transmitter. So when she goes to a lecture, she hangs a little FM transmitter around the neck of the speaker and she can pick that up 150 feet away. She has patch cords for plugging into the uh, movie uh, thing on the airplane. So all she hears is the movie and not the screaming kid that's next door. I mean, it's, <laughs> I mean, she has, she's invested heavily in all kinds of assistive technology. These same discussions, same, same kinds of stories could be told for other kinds of assistive technology. And as you look towards the future, you can imagine ocular implants, you can imagine spinal implants to, uh, to recover sensory neural and motor neural uh, function. So I, I am excited about um, the kinds of things that we can do with nerves and electronics. And over time, of course, uh, hopefully we will also learn how to deal with uh, diseases that are, are caused by um, uh, people who, who have genetic um, uh, mis you know, malformations, I guess is the right word. Yeah. So I am anticipating that technology will play an enormous role in assisting people to uh, cope with uh, daily life. And over time, I watched that technology improve. Ironically, though, computers, which are the most powerful tools ever invented, still stymie uh, people who have uh, disabilities, whether they're blind or, or visually impaired or hearing impaired, we could do better. And I'm sure Rishad uh, and I would agree on a number of things that would improve computer access for people who, uh, who need assistance. And so that's still an area that needs to be pursued. What a what a beautiful story event. I mean, I remember meeting both of you uh, in Waldorf, and one of the things I remember when you said is, my wife has a very magnetic personality. I know that was pun intended because you could stick uh, something on her head here because she had a implant, and that would actually be magnetic, right? Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a magnet inside of her head which holds the external um, um, device that's delivering the signal from the speech processor also has a magnet. So she literally just connects it to the side of her head. Thank you. I mean, that was, what a beautiful example of what, um, you know, assistive devices can do to people to lead a fulfilling life. Um, thank you so much, Vin, for sharing that. Thank it really you. made a huge difference. Uh, Rishad, do you want to sh share something about, you know, I know Wipro has contributed to so many different areas. Any final message for the audience at the India Inclusion Summit? You know, this is obviously 
a platform where we want to celebrate people's differences. Uh, so any final remarks or comments on just your personal message or what Wipro is doing in the field of disability? No, I, I think that's a great story, Vin, and I think it really brings out to life both uh, the power of uh, uh, how somebody's life can change with change and the power of technology to make that. Look, at, at, at Wipro, we've tried to be inclusive on a, on, a, on a bunch of different levels, and we're still on that journey, right? Uh, and because we really want to have diversity in every shape and form at the company, and for us, diversity means not, not only that we attract people, but that those people then feel true to truly be themselves and be able to thrive in their own context and in their own environment, uh, then feeling the need to, uh, to acclimatize and change. And so, you know, whether it be in terms of gender or attracting people, you know, enabling people with disabilities who, to work at Wipro to attract, uh, uh, you know, uh, diverse people in terms of ethnicity, and then as well as in terms of the social orientation and the whole LGBT com LGBTQ community. And, you know, it's again a journey that we've been on, but we take it, um, uh, very seriously, and it's been it's been very satisfying. And so today, you know, we have about 550 self-declared people with disabilities who are working in the organization. All our campuses are, um, uh, you know, uh, disability so accessible, yeah. uh, and accessible. And um, you know, and and we've seen, you know, as productive a workforce as anywhere else in terms of any other kind of person that joins the organization. So we want to be as inclusive and as open to people as we can be. And we, we continue to strive in that effort. And so it's an important agenda, both at every level in the organization, including at our board level in terms of diversity and inclusion. And I think, you know, I would just encourage organizations that there are other organizations out there to give it the importance that it deserves because it doesn't only really make for doing the right thing, but I think it also makes for a richer organization in terms of bringing in ideas that are very, very different from your own, bringing in people with experiences that are very, very different from your own. You know, I'll just share a quick story. You know, I was a, about 18, 20 months ago, you know, when I think about diversity, I frankly very shallowly thought about diversity from the perspective of metrics. And then I had a mentor who told me that's, you know, that, you know, I would tell them about when I was recruiting someone or looking for someone that oftentimes I'd be looking for someone who was very similar to me someone I could relate to, someone I could understand, someone perhaps I could feel comfortable having with a, a coffee or a drink with in the evening. And this person told me that's the completely wrong way to look for people. You've got to look for people who are very, very different from you, who challenge your core, who make you highly uncomfortable. They're highly functional, but they make you uncomfortable. And that's how you bring in richness of ideas. And so we've been very strongly focused on that from a, from a diversity and inclusion perspective, because I think that makes for richer uh, experiences, which are contributions by bringing in people that have very, very different experiences, not only in their professional lives, but also in their personal space. And that adds to the, to the, to the benefit of the organization. So in a very, in a way, it's actually quite self-serving for the companies to be doing that as well. So I would strongly encourage organizations to think about this and make it an important agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Rashad. On that note, I can't thank you enough uh, for being at the India Inclusion Summit virtually. I hope uh, we get the chance to see you in person whenever you know the world opens up and we get back to some sense of normalcy. Windsurf and Rashad Premji, thank you so much for doing this for us. And uh, on behalf of the entire community, thank you so much for your time and your um, your your thoughts. Thank you. I look forward. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you so much, Wind. Thank you, Rashad.